I'm on the best afternoon of the week. <laughs> Can I just exchange this? Just a there. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is Peyton Emler and I'm a member of the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. So the Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement. And if you are a student and would like to join, please contact, contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. So after the presentation, we will have some time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you have difficulty hearing during the program, please alert one of our staff members or student volunteers who will assist you. And before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. So now, please join me in welcoming Director Bill Lacey. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. Um, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago on the nicest afternoon of the week, we appreciate you taking the time to come today to today's program and I know you're going to enjoy it. Don Leslie is a farmer, veteran, and an orator with wide-ranging experience in agriculture issues. Following a grain embargo in 1982, he traveled through the USSR during the height of the Cold War. In 1983, Don met with Pope John Paul and the U.S. Secretary of Agriculture as the United States hosted the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization meeting. In addition to his service, Leslie has experienced coordinating not-for-profit programs, appearing on CBS, NBC, and ABC televisions in order to raise half a million dollars in donations of flour and noodles for individuals in poverty. I would add that Senator Dole knows Don very well and was very excited to know that he was going to be speaking today at the Dole Institute of Politics. So please welcome Don Leslie. Don? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. Um, people and staff, everyone who is here, and uh, I also uh, want to salute Senator Dole, one of the greatest Americans of all time in the history of our country, among many historical figures in our whole country who has served. And also, ladies and gentlemen, near and far, I am Don Leslie, and the year that I'm going to be starting to talk about is 1946. Rationing had been restored in America, Europe and Asia, were reeling and starving as tanks and armies and bombs had fought for every inch of ground from France all the way to Moscow. Soldiers and civilians trying to feed themselves had slaughtered every animal. No cows, no horses, no chickens, no turkeys, no infrastructure, no tractors, no nothing. Nothing to rebuild the fertility of the soil. Dikes had been blown in the Netherlands, leaving little if any hope. The war had rocked the very existence of the world's stability and fears about the new atomic bomb and the fear of the Russian expansion around the world. Everywhere was massive hunger and starvation. Severe hunger is when your body and mind cannot really function and your only thought is, is food. A friend of mine 
Glenn Jostad, POW, talked about the times they used to bring in wagons, the little bit of bread that he had for the whole week, and they'd cut it in little bit of pieces to try and get through the week. Anna Lee Woodson, who became a war bride as a little girl, was sent 90 miles to get two eggs. And Matt Knopp, liberating Czechoslovakia, said that, you know, he's amazed in this hungry village that he was in. They had all these dogs. Why do you have these dogs when you're hungry? The dogs are our only food. Starvation, hunger, the brink of death, the world had plenty of both. Hunger and starvation are, to, are not sexy stories or movies written about them. The food crisis was so dire that the President Harry Truman and Secretary of State George Marshall repeatedly addressed the nation about the food shortages. And let's go back a little bit to World War I. Of those 21 meals in a week, eight, Herbert Hoover was calling for 18 of them to be meatless and wheatless. World War I had a slogan that food can win the war and every spud can be a soldier and it was, not, it was his strong belief that he even sometimes posted his and a lot of his own personal money to provide fight hunger. Hoover raised millions of dollars for food aid. Herbert Hoover made one of the most prophetic warnings ever. And I quote, hungry people can become very uncivilized in a hurry. We as a country would later be criticized because we did not share the food we had and 23 years later we were fighting World War II. Alliances have been made and broken with bread for 6,000 years. Mankind has struggled for bread somewhere in this world. H. E. Jacobs writes how Hitler engineered famine. Only the partisans got fed. Bread cards were used to recruit followers and also recruit labor and slaves from other countries. Hitler studied the League of Nations, learning which diseases would create food deficiencies and produce, that the uh, diseases they could produce. Hunter College, New York City President George Schuster wrote, the real power of Hitler came from the pre-military age youth who had suffered from malnutrition following World War I when the USA had food and did not share it. Now today, Europe threatens the whole world with its sick, its diseased, and its hungry people. Back in the 1930s, there was depression, unemployment, weak militaries, and bank loans were being called at home and abroad. And the accident almost everywhere was on a third, authoritative authority <laughs> rulers, excuse me. Democracy was even being discredited. FDR and Churchill, our leaders, did have the foresight, however, to look at that the real issue at stake was human freedom itself and said that a government that denied its people a basic freedom was a totalitarian menace and had to be resisted, and yes, our military did prove to be the necessary men and women of the ages during World War II. And besides Hitler, Joseph Stalin killed over five million of his people by forcing collective farms and gaining control of the food supply in the Soviet Union, a horror that the Russian people called execution by starvation, a horror that even included family cannibalism, a crime of humanity. Mao Zedong starved millions of his own people in 1959, solidifying the communist rule control in China. And today, we're looking at such countries as Venezuela, North Korea, Sudan, and many other countries who are causing hunger in the world today. And maybe we can have a little bit more on that a little later. But in the 1930s, we also had drought and depression. Farm income had been reduced 65%. Only 13% of the farmers had electricity. 20% owned some kind of an old tractor. And just 34% had a telephone. There were no hybrid seeds to resist disease and dust. Oh, forgot my deal here, sorry. And dust was so thick that you couldn't breathe 
and you'd almost suffocate. You couldn't see, you couldn't hear, and you couldn't breathe. Dirt just blew the door through your doors and windows of your house. Dirt drifts covered the fence lines, and buffalo chips were considered heating fuel. Holes were dug for burial days in South Dakota as the farmers marched their wasted animals into that hole and the neighbors brought their rifles and the government furnished one bullet for each head of livestock. And if that wasn't enough, the drought brought grasshopper invasion. And the grasshoppers ate everything that the drought had not destroyed. They ate the grass, they ate the wheat, they ate the corn, they ate the tree leaves. That exposed even more soil to erosion. Grasshoppers so thick at times they even ate the water tongue, uh, the wagon tons, and they, and they ate the clothes off the clothesline and many a man was knocked to the ground as the grasshoppers hid in such swarms. Roads too slick to drive on, railroad, rail trains spun on the railroad tracks. And lucky for us, the drought ended just before World War II. And when the war began, America had the 17th largest military in the world behind Romania and maybe New Zealand. We had more horses than tanks. Our tanks were walking speed of five miles an hour, the Germans 25. Japan had the most advanced and powerful Navy in the world, and our government had a huge problem. How do we make tanks and tractors when we have neither and must have both? The government needed the farmers to produce more food than ever before and do it with less labor than they could imagine and without the machinery they needed. In 1942, new farm machinery had fallen 84% from the year before. Farm machinery, as other companies, were converted to the war machine production. And it was clear that whatever machinery you had, it had to do, and it was going to be tough going on the battlefield, and it was going to be very tough going on the farm as well. So tough that in 1942, Sears and Roebuck wrote this poster, and they call it a soldier without a uniform. And I quote, you who stand behind the plow, you pledge to feed the soldier, you pledge to feed the worker, the ally, and with God's help, all the victims of the war. You will feed the world even if you must plow by lantern light or harvest by hand or even your children's hand, even if your trucks fail and you must go back to the covered wagon again. You are a pioneer again, and you serve, and America salutes you, not like the stars on a general's shoulders, but for the stars you will keep in the flag and the stars above in the sky. With the machinery that you have, meet your 1943 goals. Bigger and harder goals to meet than last year, but goals vital to victory, unquote. The lack of machinery also brought another, it brought a, added a double whammy, the labor shortage. Because immediately 20% of the workforce was in the military forces. Defense and plants and factories needed a much larger labor force, and right now. Labor shortage shows so short and so acute that we actually did the unthinkable. We put POWs into the workplace. There were some objections at first. Mainly, I don't want to work alongside of the man that I'm buying war bonds to fight. But the War Department did order the POWs into the workforce because it was absolutely necessary and the POW labor proved crucial. In 1943, without the POWs, the whole cotton crop in South Texas would have been lost. In 1944 and 1945, the POWs saved 65% of the corn and pea crop in southern Minnesota and 34% of the potato and sugar beet crop in the northern Red River Valley. Think of this. POW labor was actually helping harvest food supplies to defeat their own country, who were already starving. And yet that same northern Red River Valley where the prisoners had helped harvest in 44 and 45 
Some of those saved harvested grains were actually sent to their homelands the following year in 1946 to fight hunger in their respective starving homelands. Think about it. Helping your enemy, America, defeat your home country, and then your former enemy, America, in just six months is sending some of that very food you har harvested back to your homeland. America's good and so are most of the people of the world. And of those 426,000 POWs, only 17 were barely guarded, by the way, only 17 were unaccounted for at the end of the war. Very few even tried to escape. And as a footnote, there were American German uh, uh, citizens who were interred as the Japanese were. And some of them were the last ones uh, released and some of them who were come citizens here had children born here were actually sent back to Germany who did not want them either. This was a hard war in many ways. In 1944 Joe Tucker of the Massey Harris Company approached the governments of Canada and the United States, with a, and he had a slogan, the battle for bread. His message was, you give me enough metal to build 500 new self-propelled combines, and I'll harvest 25 million more gr bushels of grain because of what uh, pull-type combines tramp down, opening the fields. I'll save you 333,000 man hours because one man on a combine instead of a man in both a combine and a tractor. And when the war began, there were still thrashing machines in our area. Some were required as many as 28 workers. Tucker also said, I'll save you 500,000 gallons of fuel because only one combine engine running, which is going to free up to maybe 1,000 tractors to do tillage elsewhere. And with a military pre precision, he exceeded his goals, saving grain, saving fuel and labor, and harvesting more grain, a campaign so successful that it spawned the movie The Wild Harvest, starring Alan Ladd and Dorothy L'Amour. And one of those farm front warriors, as they were called, a member of the Custom Combiners Hall of Fame was Art Howard, my friend, who took possession of a combine that he had never seen in Enid, Oklahoma from a dealer he had never met. He took a real late leap of faith when he left his animals and his farm with his elderly dad and found a way with his old trucks and rationing of food, labor, excuse me, fuel and tires and thrash on the Custom Harvest Brigade. Art said it was a time when everyone had to step up and do what was necessary to get the crop in for those who were not home to do it for themselves, all in for the war effort. As a personal note, when I was nine and a half years old, my dad asked me and put me on one of these combines that you're looking at right now. <clears throat> well, food programs, our main title today I'm going to start with the volunteer programs and then the government programs. Heifers for Relief, which some of you will recognize today as Heifers International, in 1944, David West and some friends sent some 17 uh, pregnant heifers to Europe. The recipients were then asked to share the offspring with their neighbors. But the program that I'm going to talk about mostly, there's an old tractor. Uh, I'll stay with this. <clears throat> that estimated probably to save 15 million people from starvation was a program called the Mercy Wheat Program. And it had its kickoff on April 26, 1946 in Climax, Minnesota. And maybe, just maybe, the Mercy Wheat Program back then was just a dream. Because volunteers had so much to overcome, the grain had to be brought in from the farms at a time when the farmers were planting their 1946 spring crops. 
Labor was short, equipment not only small and most needed repair, railroad cars were needed for transportation, ships to sail, politicians were seeking elections, newspapers were blurring, the whole world is starving, and we are going to run out of food ourselves, price controls were still in effect, and did we even really want to help those enemies? Many was the debates and now rationing had even been restored to 1945 levels in the United States. Endless was the obstacles, endless were the naysayers, yet these volunteers moved forward. Some said the fate of humanity and the fruits of the hard-fought battlefield victory hung on a mercy wheat moment, maybe even the world peace. Farmers did indeed change the world one boxcar at a time, the farmers' thoughts of starving children of their beaten enemies put their faith to the test, overcoming the fear and resentment of their fellow human beings, and it was not easy. And I'm going to do a little weekly summary here now. Gordon Roth, the public relations director for Farmers Union GTA, had a weekly addressed his farmers and his listeners by radio. And I'm going to do some weekly quotes. March 24, 1946, and I do quote now, the world is gripped by two things, the fear of the new atomic bomb and the hope of having enough wheat to feed the whole continents of hungry and starving people. For 6,000 years, people have struggled for bread. The first word of war is spoken by guns, but the last word is spoken by bread. Alliances are made and broken with bread, food for peace must be the American slogan of the day, and world peace begins on the American farm, your farm. Week later, the March 31st, the world needs wheat besides the ravaged food shortages of the war. Massive drought has swept the whole southern hemisphere, Asia, and North and South Africa, Australia, Argentina, and all those war-torn countries. And remember, our drought ended just before the World War II started. And Roth quotes President, quotes President Truman, if any nation wants security for itself, it must be ready and willing to share security with all. That is the price that each nation must pay for food peace. And right now, the price of security is wheat. Wheat spells victory. A week later on April 7th, Roth. This appeal comes from 300 million people facing starvation, a famine so vast that it threatens to equal the scourge, scour the scourge out from out of the dark ages. This appeal is to you, the greatest wheat belt in the world, an appeal for mercy. Next fall is too late, it must be done now. And on the 14th, a week later, the threat of famine can sweep like a prairie fire over half the world. It's a race between 100 million bushels of wheat and starvation. Right now, wheat is the major weapon of peace. Your grain bin is the arsenal that must be moved to the front lines of the fight against starvation. And on that same day on the 14th, Director Florio LaGuardia, the former New York City mayor, appointed Enron director for only two weeks, <coughs> said, and I quote, if wheat is delivered at once, it will save, and I can assure you I am not exaggerating, the lives of millions of people who face death by starvation by the end of May through June and July. The food in some countries does not permit men to work. They are too weak to work. They are too weak to work in the mines and in the industry or the fields, and I know that the American farmer will come through as he's never failed his country and he's never failed humanity, so I appeal to all God-loving loving citizens to come to the rescue of hungry people and earn the everlasting gratitude of God Almighty. And on Easter, April 21st, Roth pulled out all of the stops, asked an army chaplain to do his radio address. And Reverend M spared no words, and I quote, Easter is hope and life itself. As agriculture goes, so goes the nation. The Northwest farmers are the breadbasket of the nation. I should point out here, when I say this, the Northwest was the only area in the country, believe it or not, that had grain storage at this time. 
The rest of the country did not. So the Northwest farmers are the bread basket of the nation, and with millions starving, much depends on you as the cry from millions of starving must be answered promptly from the wheat on your farms. And profoundly, the reverend went on to say, the seeds of World War II were planted during the starvation period of World War I. At that time, if you recollect, America failed to get enough food to the starving, although we had plenty to eat. Resentment and warped minds followed in the wake of starvation. This, this resulted in less than 25 years that the sons of many a Northwest farmer marched off to war after Pearl Harbor never to come home again, nationally speaking. It's a case of what you sow. Still quoting. The Reverend, Friday night, the president again spoke to the nation and asked you to have a heart to help the greatest threat of starvation in the history of mankind. Director LaGuardia declared eight nations will be without food in a few days unless wheat is rushed to them at once and three months from now millions of starving will no longer be among the living because wheat is stored on your farms means that it largely depends on you whether the starving will be spared an agonizing death within the next three months. The eyes of the world are upon you to see if you will vindicate yourself in the court of humanity. Today is the biblical cry, have mercy on us, unquote. Five days later, April 26, 1946, LaGuardia, then Ron director, came to tiny, tiny climax. And I think I need some help right here. Oh, here's the harvest brigade. That, oh, that's the tractor. Here's the harvest thing after those combines got in place. This is grain stored in, uh, in um, Canton Street. And volunteer programs, and here we go. Some of the plays that made it climax. Thank you for your patience, by the mm -hmm. way. I was supposed to give you more than a warning. Fine. Okay, here we go. director of UNRWA pays a visit to the town of Climax in America's great Midwestern wheat belt. LaGuardia has come to impress the farmers with the need for wheat to prevent famine and to ask them to sell their reserve holdings before the new harvest. The wheat farmers of this Minnesota area respond to the appeal with 50,000 bushels. Trucks drive into one load into a 25-car freight train which will carry the grain to eastern United States ports for overseas shipment. The necessary shipping is being allocated, LaGuardia told the farmers, and the Midwestern wheat belt must and will supply the wheat. This train load was the immediate response to UNRWA director LaGuardia's appeal. It is part of the steady flow of grain that must be maintained until the threat of famine has disappeared in Europe and Asia. Use Advantage 2 monthly on your cat to prevent... <laughs> he sounded better than me. Well, anyway, while he's uh, working on that, Climax is, is in the middle of the Red River Valley of the North. It's a town of 202. 5,000 people that day, as you saw in their Sunday best, turned out to greet and uh, host the LaGuardia. LaGuardia is speech was so important, an agriculture speech, if you can believe it, was carried live across the entire United States on CBS radio. The New York Times published it the next day, word for word, and in his speech, and I'm going to quote now, 
LaGuardia said, although money could restore re recon re reconstruction, money cannot restore bodies. People cannot eat money. What Europe needs is food so that the enfeebled and the impoverished can work again. Cities will be restored in time, but the bodies of millions of people who suffered and living on 25 to 1,000 grams a day will never be restored. These children that I'm telling you about, this generation is almost gone. You have been told that the next 90 days is critical, but in those 90 days will mean eternity for many because we cannot get the food to them fast enough to save thousands and thousands from starvation. And you know what it means to be living on 25 to 1,000 grams of food per day. And that's no exaggeration, he says. It's a helpless and most difficult task, and there's just as much love in the family life in a Chinese family as any other family. There's just as much love in a Chinese mother as any other mother. And it's estimated that if the war had not ended in 1945, Japan alone, Japanese people, 10 million of them would have starved to death in 1946 alone from starvation. Some Japanese were cutting grains of rice in two. Such was the shortage of food. But however, not all people were very com were comfortable at all feeding the enemy. I mean, sons had been killed, neighbors' sons had been killed or maimed in two world wars. Feelings were raw, resentment was real, and hard feelings and strong opinions abound everywhere, and not the least was high noon for the Nuremberg trials in Germany, where every day exposed a new, ugly Nazi war crime. And Japanese atrocities were also coming to light. And doubters remained at home as well. Politicians, business people joined the crowd saying, we're going to run out of food ourselves. Rationing of grain, back to 1945 levels. Newspapers ran the headlines, the whole world will go hungry. Bread shortage in 30 days. We'll even run out of bread. And the acting Secretary of State, Gene Atchison, in a desperate panic that very day on the 26th, was said, the only way to get the wheat is to seize it off of the farms. But Roth, however, stayed on message. He said, the real heroes of today are the foot soldiers of the soil, the foot soldiers in the battle for wheat and the war against hunger. April 26th was the start to feed millions to keep them alive. And the Mercy Wheat Program was the beginning of several that saved 15 million people and certainly set the tone for the government to come in with government programs later. In 1947, Iris Gabriel started a program which became known as the Silent Guest Program by setting one empty plate at her table and then representing that one hungry person around the world and then sending the money uh, to the agency. Soon, the country was doing it and the care packages were headed overseas. The Friendship Train a symbol of American humanitarian and peacemaking. A sign said, your chance to contribute to world peace. One woman said, I would rather send milk than to have to send my son back to Europe. Such was the fear of hunger and communism. Columnist Drew Pearson said, citizens can make a difference. Ordinary Americans can craft foreign policy rather than sit on the sidelines and food and donations poured in. And on Thanksgiving holidays, the port dock workers loaded ships every day that was vital to reach the parents and the kids overseas in time for Christmas and New Year's. The port supervisor, John Shaughnessy, said, I don't know what it must feel like for a parent to have even one of his children starving, and we can't be happy here until they're a little happier there. Once again, the greatest generation had spoken with deeds and the volunteer programs, again, helped make the case for government programs to come. In 1948, the food crisis still remaining. 
and it threatened to spiral the whole world into more chaos. And with the cry, there can be no peace built on empty stomachs, the Nebraska farmers and churches and school kids and volunteers and spread across states celebrated Lincoln's birthday by picking up and packing and donating food to Europe and Asia, picking up supplies as they moved along to the coast. Their motto, honor Abe's birthday with malice towards none and charity for all. These goodwill gestures help Congress pass government programs later. One of them, the Truman Doctrine. The Allied liberators had found Germany had destroyed virtually every railroad, every port facility, communication, merchant marine in Greece, and over 1,000 villages had been burned. Livestock, poultry, and draft animals had almost disappeared. The children appeared tubular, and there was all the savings had been wiped out by inflation. Truman's message, the very existence of the Greek state is threatened by terrorists led by the communists and threatening all of their surrounding countries and Turkey's water straits. Germans, Truman said, we just spent $341 billion on World War II, and I'm asking for one-tenth of one percent of that amount to keep from losing Turkey and Greece. And it passed on March 12th. And I'm told, uh, recently I was told by a, a vacationer there that he was in Greece when they were still, a couple of years ago, celebrating Truman Days and with a Truman statue. 1945, General Eisenhower, ordered to bed by his doctors because he was so exhausted. However, he personally appeared before Congress. And straightforward was his message. To retain our battlefield victory, funding for food is a must. The beginning of the Marshall Plan had not really went very well. There was a lot of money that had been spent and it wasn't working. I shocked Secretary of State George Marshall so alarmed at the Soviet influence and decided immediately that Something's got to be done. He called a meeting in Paris of 16 countries because one nation, helping one nation at a time, was not working. So he said, OK, everybody here has got to make a plan, a unified plan, and we're going to coordinate this plan. And it's going to be over in four years, period. There would be no extension. Russia was invited. Russia attended. Russia walked out refusing the Marshall Plan, which condemned their people and their satellites to food shortages and hunger until even 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. Alan Douglas, Dulles, who later would be late, uh, named the CIA director, was asked, you know, what are we going to give anyway? Well, he said, at first it will be food. Be food and fuel and fertilizer to keep the body and the soul together so that men and women in Europe will have the strength to be able to work. And then when they have the strength, we'll be giving them some tools so they can increase their own production of food and fuel and fertilizer. And indeed, the very first ship load carried 19,000 tons of wheat from Texas. 1947, Truman formally presented the $13 billion Marshall Plan to Congress and then to Marshall as if he was running for president, crisscrossed the entire nation, selling the program to the American people. And on April 3, 1948, Truman signed the Marshall Plan into law. In 1953, Marshall became the only general ever to win a Nobel Peace Prize. The British Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan called the Marshall Plan a lifeline to sinking men, bringing hope where there was none. And there's a footnote to history, a very important point. We sent the money, but mostly we were the only country in, that had the food industry and the means and etc. 75% of that money was used to buy purchases from the United States. You are what you saw. A couple months later, really bad tension really got hot. Russia cut off all ways to West Berlin. And the United
United States and its allies were in a tough spot. Do we fight a war that we can't win because Russia surrounded all of West of Berlin? Or the other choice, do we just let Berlin go? Truman did neither. Instead, he sent huge cargo planes to deliver goods to West Berlin and somehow millions of tons of food and medical supplies were sent. And on one day called the Easter Parade, Enough coal was delivered in that one day to fill 600 railroad cars. Airplanes landing every three minutes in all weather conditions for over a year, impossible, but they did it. And then a real hero came. Captain Gail Howison, also known as a candy bomber, was looking at some kids one day standing along a fence line. He walked over and gave them his last two sticks of gum on the condition on the condition they would not fight over the gun. To his surprise, those kids took that two pieces of gum and cut it and broke it into the tiniest, the tiniest of pieces and spread it around. And when it was all gone, the kids passed the empty wrappers around so they could all smell it. Such was the crisis. And the next day, Halverson dropped candy from his airplane, and all 23 tons of candy were dropped in the little Vittles campaign. One eight-year-old eight little boy, crying, said, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. Besides serving, saving Berlin and keeping Berlin's freedom, the airlift broke the animosity between the Germans and the Americans as fighting enemies. They went on to become, from that moment on, true friends and true allies. Germany went on to play a pivotal role in the Cold War, including the beginning of NATO and also the Cuban Missile Crisis. Folks, it was our dads and granddads who purchased, who provided the human fuel to help fight the war and the food to complete the post-war victory. In conclusion, we didn't starve our enemies, we freed them. The farmers set a precedent of helping those who once fought by providing bread Bread that together we break as friends of peace, a spontaneous act of humanity that saved millions of people from starvation. By doing so, the farmers sustained a lifeline much the same way as the Higgins boats did the liberating of France and the liberation of much of the world. Farmers in our country provided the daily bread to a war-torn, blood-soaked world. And with these volunteer programs leading the way, the great Marshall Plan, and, uh, and those programs went on, and they paid us back. They paid us back with 72 years without a shot being fired or any bloodshed in that part of the world. We need to remember that all the great civilizations of the world had great agriculture and ceased to be that great civilization when they lost or gave their agriculture up, be it whether it was Egypt, Greece, Florence, Rome, or Russia under Catherine the Great. It was a great, great production thing. Today, and we can discuss this, Venezuela, and for that matter, North Korea, Sudan, and some of the other slums in Kenya and so forth, and we'll talk about that in the question period. In World War II, there were 65 to 70 million people who were killed, probably half of them civilians. Our country had 465,000 men and women killed. Roosevelt called them the pride of our nation. They didn't die giving their lives. Rather, they lost their lives. They didn't want to die. They wanted to come home. 
They wanted to have families. They wanted to be happy. They wanted to have freedom. But freedom was so important, they fought and lost their lives so that we can have families and happiness and freedoms that they didn't have. And always remember the Iwo Jima cross that I saw that read, remember for all of your tomorrows, we gave up all of our todays. Yes, we have a great and great and proud military, thankfully. We have a great agriculture, and we have great people, which makes us a great free country. And may God always bless America, keep her free, keep her well fed, and remember to whom much is given, much is expected, and I thank you very much. So I think now we're going to go to questions and answers. And there's one down here, ma'am. And by the way, I think it was explained that all the questions must be answered asked through the microphone so they can get it on the recording thing. Where did you farm? I am uh, 65 miles from Canada, 20 miles from North Dakota, in the northern part of the northern Red River Valley of the North, Warren, Minnesota. I'm there because my dad was there, and his dad and my great-grandfather. Great <laughs> Next question. Don't be bashful. I probably don't have the answer, but. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, just a second, ma'am. Well, let's take that mic here, if you would. That's a that's a good point. Thank you. I can't remember what I was saying. Oh, you're okay. You're fine. Just go ahead. Oh, we'll just give you a moment. The lady in the back had a question, and then we'll come back. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> it shouldn't be so hard. What a thing to, to hear you were just talking about food, and it's one of the most important things. <laughs> I've heard anybody talk about. I mean, what a thing to talk about and, and realize how important it is. Even in, in the war, maybe especially in the war. I don't know why I'm getting so, but it just hit me. Well, your question is well taken because we in America really don't know that. No, we don't. We don't. Yeah. But food is such a major thing and we have it. Yeah. And we have so abundance of it that we don't even know we have the abundance. Because I've exactly. never walked into any of our stores that are half empty on their shelves. I have been around the world several in several different places mm -hmm. where the shelves are not half full or they're empty. And I can share with you when uh, uh, Mr. Lacey mentioned that uh, you know I had been in Soviet Union Remember when Reagan, President Reagan, made the comment about uh, the evil empire in Russia? Well, the, hot, w the Cold War was very, very hot at that time. And it kind of diffused that each country sent three people, low-level exchange team between the two countries. And I was uh, picked as the only farmer. We had an agronomist from Montana State, and we had a, a USDA fellow from Washington, D.C. And we toured the whole Soviet Union for three and a half weeks because they were supposedly starving. Well, I didn't starve while I was there because they were proving that we were not, they were not hungry. I mean, we had maybe five, six, ten-course meals a day, 
sometimes in a place, uh, you know, someplace, sometimes in a school, sometimes out in a picnic area where you drove around a bunch of trees and here we had crystal and everything else set out. But one day, and it wasn't supposed to happen, but I got out of bed early and went down the street by myself. They had a grocery store that was open and it's in the middle of the country. And I'll not forget because they had 17 different aisles, you know, or things. If you had soaps over here and, you know, cheer, uh, breakfast food over here and etc. Well, the one that interested me and I walked to the back or to the front of the thing was the meat. They were cutting meat that day. And I'll never, ever forget it. Because as I stood there and watched, they had a line, by the way, at each one of these 17 things. And as I watched them, they were cutting beef. You didn't order chicken or pork or fish or whatever it was. That day it was beef. And in a newspaper would come out, well, you might get steak, you might get roast, you might get liver, you might get hoofs, you might get whatever it was. But whatever it was, you took it. And if you didn't take it, you didn't get anything. Now, that's hunger. But what we're talking about here is starvation. Starvation is when you sit here and your eyes kind of roll and you can't think of anything but food and you are about to pass away and you will eat it. I mentioned Glenn Jostad. In the wagon that brought his, his bread in was also the same wagon they hauled the excrement out when it went out. That's how hungry people are. And that's something we've never had. But you know what's even bigger in this? Is that we're, let's talk a little bit about Venezuela. I was in Venezuela probably 25 years ago. A great country, great people. They ate, they ran. In fact, it seemed like every pageant that come along, Miss Venezuela was the prettiest girl there and won the pageant. Well, now it's terrible because they're using food. People can't get food. It's on the black market. It's on, it's not only on the black market, but it's, uh, they don't have availability to it. They're standing 36 hours a week in line to get something. Inflation is so bad that even though they increase the amount of money that you have, it, it goes nowhere. North Korea is another one. They're building missiles. What about the people? All we hear about their hunger. We don't see them, but they're there. And I just read here, uh, middle of the year. We've all heard a lot about environmental things. I'm not going to talk about environmental issues. But in this particular article, they were talking about Kenya, which is a pretty good country, good country, good people. And they were talking about what was happening there because of the hunger out country, and this is happening in many countries around the world is that the garbage pits, people, pigs, goats, birds, were all digging through those. They went on to mention that one lady was cooking chicken intestines for her food. Now, their point was, we're just on the verge of having a world disease problem. Because as Disney said, it's a small, small world. People are mobile today. They can get around pretty fast. Well, my wife has a piglet in her chest. That's how close we are to some of the animals that we are. If they get a virus that we don't know about, Ebola, Sitka come to mind. See how, how fast this can be? Hunger is something that's out there, and hunger is not something that we can go let go by. This is something that we must do. And I want to make one other point about inflation. When I was uh, at a history tour of Munich in Germany, and some of the questions that you have, I asked. One of them is, how come you let Hitler in charge? You know, well, I talked about a few of them. But inflation, I mentioned inflation in, in Venezuela. This fellow told me that when he was a student, he went into a coffee shop and got a cup of coffee, and it cost him five marks. It was good, so he had a second one. It was nine and a half marks. Now think of what that does to you. You get up in the morning and you got $100,000 in the bank. 
you have a cup of coffee, and you have your second cup of coffee, you're down to 50,000. By nightfall, you're penniless. So unravels the thing that the government in Munich once turned over in two hours. And that set the seeds for people like Hitler and so forth. Your question. So on the practical side, how would you envision helping Venezuela then? Like the United States actually helping them uh, with some of their food products? Well, that's a great question and it's a very tough answer. I'm going to give you a little short story first and then I'll answer your question, okay? I, uh, Will Rogers was talking to uh, uh, a general one day who was complaining about all the Germans sinking American shipping and what to do about it. He says, well, it's easy, just boil the ocean. Boil the ocean. The general went nuts. He said, boil the ocean. You know how impossible logistics and et cetera. He says, general, he said, uh, solutions are my game, implementation is yours. <laughs> so I think it's really already been done when you think about it. It was impossible with the Mercy Wheat program. There was neighbors that were very upset with neighbors. There was government people that certainly wasn't going to spend any more money on the standpoint. Yet we had the Mercy Wheat program, we had the friendship train, we had the freedom train, we had the care package thing. And by that time, the Congress got enough thing that, hey, there's enough political backbone out here that we can do what the president's asking for. And pretty soon we had the Marshall Plan. And then when it became impossible, what did we do in Berlin? We found a way. I don't know what the way is, but there's people here who are smart enough in this country to find a way. We have done it before. We can do it again. And my thought is that, yes, we got to have the guns. Thank God Almighty for our military and our military people, because we would not be here without them. But on the other side, we, alongside of that, just as important, is food. And food is a weapon. So how do we get it into some place? I have an idea. People who are starving will just run anywhere or run over anybody to get the food, guns or not. Now, how do we do it? Solutions are my game. Implementation <laughs> is somebody else's. But I don't think we're talking about it, and I think we should be talking about it. Thank you. I agree, but part of that was my question about how we could get the grain that's sitting out in western Kansas on the ground. It can't be sold, and the farmers don't have very much in the way of income because there's such a glut of grain. And it seems to me that we should send it somewhere where it's needed. And it would help everybody because the price would go up as far as the farmers are concerned. And the people who receive it would, of course, benefit. If I heard your question right, you're talking about that we have grain, a surplus of grain, and yet it's not moving to where we need it, right? Would that be the crutch of it? Okay. Well, <laughs> that is true, we do have. And I think, you know, if we go back to these volunteer programs, what were we talking about? We didn't give that grain away, they sold it. The government come through with a program of a 30 cent bonus for people who would participate, which really wasn't very much when you think about it because, you know, price controls are on. If you're short of grain, you're the only one that's got it, as soon as those price controls come off, and industry did it, they held their product until the price controls did come off, and of course, the prices went up. Why wouldn't a farmer do the same thing? Well, that's another obstacle he had to overcome in his mind to do the right thing. So, but they did do it, at least enough to do it. And I think people forget how much really it means, because I have a quarter in my hand here, just 25 cents. And if I flip that in the air right there, if the market goes up 25 cents today, that's $80 million of wheat extra in the state of Kansas. 
Uh, if we look at it too, I don't know what the exact number is today, but I, when I was back doing this sort of thing, <clears throat> when bread was about a dollar, dollar and a quarter at the most, there was two and a half cents of wheat in one of those loaves of bread, 12 cents for the wrapper. It's probably very similar today, okay? So now how do we do it? Well, there's science around. I would say that we have went for it, and, and let me go back to this. This is maybe an idea. Following World War II, we come with, uh, and the Marshall Plan and everything, we come with a, a program that would not be popular today, but it worked, PL 480. PL 480 was a program that all of the countries in the world who were starving and met you know, our friendly relationship, could buy grain from us in their own currencies. That's big. And because of that, the first 10 that, were, that did that, eight of them become regular customers of us or somebody in the world. Now, industry is not exactly in, into that part of it. I don't know that farmers are either, but I will say this that industry is in it for a profit. But the government maybe has to look a little bit better, broader because food could be an added thing to the arsenal that we got. The grain bin is an arsenal. And if we find a way to contribute and use it with that, at least start the discussion. We're starting in the right thing. For people who are interested in the environment, we're talking about it, whether you like what's happening or not. On the other hand, we're not talking about the disease factor. You know, what was it in World War I? Somebody can help me. But how many millions of people died from the flu that went around the world just because people intermingled? Folks, that's not something that's out in the distance. That's in your lives, especially you young people. So it's in our interest. It's in our national interest. Military is national security. Food is national security. Military and food are a very strong combination of national security. And somehow or another, all will have to participate in it. Whether we subsidize it or do something, and industry is going to get upset, oh, it's not fair trade, it's not this kind of trade. Well, if you're letting them starve, you're not trading with them anyway, unless they got the money. So somehow or another, we've got to broaden our discussion, in my view. Next. Yes, ma'am. So you've talked about Venezuela and I don't Ken know well. Oh, you've talked about Venezuela and, and Kenya. What about North Korea? Do you see food as part of a solution there? Well, North Korea, you know, and I'm not, I don't see what goes across any president's desk, so I would not put myself in a position that I can answer your question as to what is really happening because I don't think we have all of the things. But it would seem to me, just as a general thumb rule, that all of us were down to the thing where we can't eat, don't have anything to eat. Our kids are starving, our grandkids are hungry. I'd do something if I could find something to do. And I think mankind has done that. How did Hitler get a lot of his followers? He gave them food. He denied it to others. It works. It's got a history. Stalin, what did he do? Mao Zedong, what did these people do? They were obstacles back in their day. North Korea is a huge problem. I don't know how we're going to get out from underneath it, but we need some we need some power from above to help us with that. But there's got to be a way. I just have a feeling if you put the food out there, but I saw some of those lines in those hungry countries and et cetera, boy, you better get out of the way because they're coming to get the package. And maybe it isn't in a package. We've got scientists, for heaven's sakes. We've got things that doesn't have to go in the size of a loaf of bread. You know, the troops are familiar with the fact that, you know, we had K rations and those type of things. That's not what we call food, <clears throat> but it is substance or hunger. And it does, you see, if you don't have any food, it seems to me that somebody's got food, whether they're a terrorist or whatever it is. And by the way, 
look at all the terrorists. Do they look well fed? Do they look full of vigor? Or do they have nice bodies? Do they jump around and things? They're well fed. The people they're terrorizing, they don't look so hot. They're beleaguered. They're dirty. They can hardly move. They don't have the food. Again, it's happened before. 6,000 years it's been around. We just have a new society, a new world time with electronic things. How do we do it? But there's a will, there's a way. Or unless you like Churchill said, if there's a will, I want to be in it. <laughs> More questions? Would you say that the biggest reason why we don't have a lot of food aid in this country anymore is that there's been a culture shift, whether it be from the agricultural producers or from the government or from the citizenry as a whole, that we don't think of that as something uh, important uh, anymore? I, I'm sorry, I, I just <coughs> didn't. I, I got these tractor oh, no, ears okay. and they don't work okay. very well. <clears throat> and my batteries went dead, so. <laughs> Would you say that it's a culture shift is why we don't have as much, is why the U.S. does not do as much food aid as we used to, and a culture shift from the agricultural producers, the regular everyday food consumers and citizenry of this country, and also from the government side. So, I mean, from by when the time we had the Mercy program and to now, there's, I kind of might be leading the question there. Well, I don't know if we've got a culture shift as much. Um, you know, obviously society has switched, you know. We have cars and we have highways and we have airplanes and different things than when I was really growing up. Um, so there certainly has been a living change. I remember my mother when she was having difficulty in her last days saying that she remembered the last day she got into town from the farm uh, was October of the year and didn't get back in town until the next April. And she said that uh, I'm still mad about that. Uh, she also, you know, I can remember that we didn't have electricity until I was 10 years old. Um, when we had the radio with a battery, we kids would you know, to preserve the battery, would gather around when we're all there together to be able to listen to it as much as we could. Um, so, you know, we've had a society switch because we're on to, on to the electronics. And I'm not one to say that we can fight progress because we need to have the electronics. But I am one to say that electronics are not a perfect world. You know, 20 years ago we used to joke about the standpoint that you looked at your telephone or something to get away from the world. Now you gotta look, look at, get into the world to get away from your cell phone. And that brings us into a different thing because now we got false news, we got people pouring money over to us. I'd say the biggest change is that we haven't secured ourselves. Now what's security? Well, we can tap Foreign countries can buy our elections, they can put money into our elections and et cetera. The news media has their thing, they're trying to sell their programs, their et cetera. They're not all Walter Cronkites like in my day where the standpoint where people are, okay, this is one side saying this, this is one side saying this, and now you in the middle figure it out. They're telling you what you should know. And if they don't, they have a little huddle like concerned citizens who tell you what they heard. So that's the shift that I think is really out there, and I think one of the things that we, you know, I'm for electronics, so don't get me wrong, but we need to go back to things like the U.S. mail in the fact for voting. Yes, it's going to take longer. People aren't going to get the inside story, but it's secure. If you want to, there isn't anybody in here who, or any country in the world that can't be hacked anymore. So if you want security, you're going to have some of those old-fashioned things. You don't have to have them all, but here and there, there's a place for them. 
I don't know if that answers your question. Oh, sorry. Um, well, I guess more specifically, my question would be, so in the 40s, there was a higher percentage of family-owned farms, so smaller-sized farms. Now we have a lot more industrial-type, large-scale agriculture. And so I guess to get to the heart of my question more so was, do you think that the switch from small family farms to industrial scale agriculture makes it less likely that we will do food aid to other countries because of that sort of values change? Well, there was naysayers back in those days too, you know. Again, we didn't have the electronics. I think that does play a big part in it. As far as the farmers go, you know, we're considered a large farmer back home. But, you know, there's three of us on that farm, so I still consider it a family farm. Right, yeah, and I, I work with a farming organization, and, and so I realize point, that scale and, doesn't and necessarily mean not family. And I found out uh, the hard way, and lucky enough that the good Lord took care of me, that if you didn't uh, farm for a profit, the banker was going to make sure you weren't farming. So uh, we're in a capitalistic system, and somebody's got to lead the way. You know, I'm kind of encouraged, if you will, and I, don't, I can't speak on their behalf because I don't know any of the people. But last year, a fellow by the name of Anthony Pratt, who's president, uh, CEO of Pratt Industries, held a big conference, and his thing was export food, create jobs. It was just last year. And to back it up, he took out Wall Street Journal ads to do it. He's doing the same thing this year and has already taken out ads, okay? Those are people who have the background, the finances, and et cetera, because he was encouraged to do so, I'm told, without me talking to him, by people like Bill Gates. Bill Gates has a good friend in Warren Buffett. Now we're talking about people who have real money, who are interested in exporting food. Doesn't that kind of sound like what we're talking about? So how do we get those together? I think that's a dilemma. Someplace it's got to start. And maybe that's what you're talking about. We're, in a capitalistic system, we're all going to have to make money. We're going to all have to make the house payment and buy the food and put the clothes on. But at the same time, we're going to have to go to the next level in the standpoint that we can't forget about because we've been given much as a country and so much is expected of us and much we do but there's still more to do. Yeah, I think you answered my question. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I may be scared everybody to do that. <laughs> All done? Okay. Thank you very much. You've been wonderful.